uh, thank you, Michael, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here again this year. And um, as with uh, everyone and everything, time keeps going past and uh, we keep trying uh, further research, further experimentation and um, further improvements. So I'll try and explain this year or, or describe a little bit about what we've done to date. So I thought I'll give a rough overview. I'll try and get it through quick. There's a few things to go over. So I'll talk mostly about clinical applications of adipose-derived stromal or stem cells and um, explain some of the uh, findings we've had since. Basically, the procedure is uh, it's an autologous single-setting procedure. It uh, requires a mini liposuction, taking a bit of abdominal tissue, taking the liposuspirate, removing the lipids, um, taking the stromal cells, and activating them with some low-level lights and then returning them back to the patient. But we, before I get into that, I'll try not to talk too much about stem cells. Some of you probably know about it more than I do. Um, basically, what is a stem cell? A stem cell is a cell that can self-renew and it has some form of potency. And what they mean by potency an embryonic stem cell, for example, is totipotent. It can turn into just about every tissue. And adult stem cells have limited potency, so they're called multipotent. Our interest, of course, is adult stem cells because it's something that has, they have been used for quite a long time. And adult stem cells are uh, divided into two types of stem cells at the moment. One is hematopoietic derived stem cells and mesenchymal stem cells. Now, hematopoietic stem cells are, as you know, to drive a hematopoietic type division um, in our blood and white blood cells, and uh, mesenchymal stem cells are our tissue stem cells or progenitor cells. So if we look at the mesogenic process, mesenchyme stem cells um, leads to osteogenesis, chondrogenesis, myogenesis, marrow stroma, uh, tendon, ligaments and others. So that's the type of tissue uh, we can turn these cells into in culture and that's their role within the physiology. And there's two sources of stem cells at the moment that's widely used at. Just about every tissue in the body has its own specific type of stem cell. So you get cardiac progenitor cells in the heart you have uh, synovial stem cells in joints and so forth. But uh, taking it a few st steps back on the ladder, the two types of mesenchyme sources of mesenchyme stem cells is bone marrow, which has been widely used. Um, more recently, it's been adipose tissue, and that's caused a lot of attention, and I'll explain why it's had so much interest. And of course, peripheral blood mesenchyme stem cells. Where are these stem cells in fat? You will see in adipose tissue, and there's some good work done in Korea, where they have clearly shown they're around the vasculature. These stem cells lie around the small blood vessels in the vasculature. Hence why it's stromal vascular fraction they say they take out. Um, how did they prove that these cells were stem cells from the um, adipose tissue? Well, they, t they can turn them in culture into pancreatic cells, into neurons, cartilage, liver, myocardium, bone, muscle, adipose tissue itself, and endothelium. What our, in what our interest was as a company in research is what is the physiological role of these stem cells? Uh, what attracts a stem cell to a damaged region? Um, it's quite clearly shown that if we cut ourselves, platelets will go to that area. Uh, they will release a whole lot of growth factors and chemoattractants and mesenchyme stem cells will move from the bone marrow into the periphery and try and heal the area that was injured. So there's a fair bit of work done as to what attracts endogenous stem cells to a damaged area. And it's, they've shown it's hypoxia, scatter factor, hepatocyte growth factor and of course platelets. But interestingly, since this is an anti-aging conference, we well know that someone who's young heals very quick and someone who old does not heal very quick. So if we look at the presence of mesenchyme stem cells in bone marrow, it declines with age and it declines rapidly after we're born. And so this has a lot of interest in the anti-aging or in aging medicine itself. And where can stem cells 
they call it regenerative medicine. There's something that they can help to regenerate tissue or repair. Well, ageing is the most degenerative disease of them all. So this is uh, something that is of uh, interest. Uh, we haven't yet assessed as to mesenchyme stem cells in fat. It's not that ratio, but it does decrease. Not only do, do their numbers decrease with age, but also their ability to function correctly. If we take these stem cells and we inject them into somebody, where, where do they go? And there's some very good studies that were initially done in nude mice, where they took adipose-derived mesenchyme stem cells, a human, and administered them intravenously into mice and checked to see where these cells were 75 days later. It's quite easy, you just look for human DNA in a mouse. And what's of interest in this uh, publication that was published back in 2007, and, and there was another one in 2008, is that 75 days later, they could find these cells in the spleen, in the pancreas, in the kidney, in the liver. A lot were in the lung because these cells are slightly bigger than what a mouse's cells are, and they get trapped in the lung being an intravenous infusion. But skeletal muscle, and more importantly, they found them in the brain, which suggests that these cells can cross the blood-brain barrier and in cardiac tissue. There was another interesting paper in uh, 2003 where they were able to show that mesenchyme stem cells will go to the injured area. Um, when we, in, this is a, a case that we did in Greece where we labelled the mesenchyme stem cells using uh, 99TC HMPAO and we looked where did these stem cells go. Interestingly, this patient was a cerebellar atrophy patient, but he had Deputran syndrome in his right hand, which is basically a ligamentous uh, inflammatory disorder. He had seven nodules, 12 nodules, sorry, in his right hand. Now you can see on the, on the left here where the intravenous infusion went in, this is 24 hours later, the background staining is you'll always get something in the bladder and the large intestine. You can see there's some deposit there in his, in his liver, but what's really of interest here is that the cells went to the inflammatory area of his right hand. He didn't have, in, he didn't have Dipitrans in the left hand. So there's, there's a clear indication here that these cells um, were attracted to the injured area, to the inflamed area. What we now know is that uh, with a lot of work that Osiris has done in the US is that mesenchyme stem cells secrete a plethora of different type of factors. In actual fact, uh, this is a, a nice slide which shows the effect of or the interaction between mesenchyme stem cells and antigen presenting cells. And you can see from this is that it's, it's quite well known now that mesenchyme stem cells have an immunomodulatory effect. In other words, they secrete factors that cause uh, or promote a Th2 response. So there were studies to say that, okay, so the question is, do these cells go and become new tissue or do they actually just go to a to an injured area or stay away from an injured area in a paracrine fashion and secrete a plethora of growth factors. If we look at the injury response cascade and we have an acute injury, there's a whole lot of different cytokines and factors released which attract uh, mesenchyme stem cells which further release various growth factors to cause healing. In an embryonic stage, you will not see hardly any scarless regeneration. You'll see a much larger response from the mesenchyme stem cells. The older we are, you'll see a much higher scar, uh, scar formation and much less of a mesenchyme stem cell response. So we're looking at a trophic type of relationship here. So the fate of adipose-derived stem cells or mesenchyme stem cells after implantation? Well... The questions are, do they disperse into adjacent tissue and become the various tissues they're supposed to become? Do they differentiate into component cell types and integrate with the target tissue? Now, we've been a bit spoilt with hematopoietic stem cells because we know they will drive different cell lineages. We know, they, do they secrete a whole lot of growth factors and variety of different things that cause that effect to happen? They, do they further stimulate other local progenitors in the area to cause a healing? and also attract growth blood vessels towards them. We know that. So what is it out of all of these that's really happening? So I'll try and explain with some of the work we've done what may 
uh, these mesenchyme stem cells be doing? So the conclusion derived so far in the literature suggests that local accumulation and implantation of a large number of mesenchyme stem cells or adipose derived mesenchymes can improve the structure and function of damaged tissue. So really they're a repair cell. Why fat? Now I'm going back as to why not peripheral blood? Why, why not bone marrow? Why did we choose fat? The reason we chose fat is because of the number of mesenchyme stem cells we can actually take out of fat. Um, out, of a, out of 100 mil of blood, we'll be lucky. It's like trying to find the one spectator in 12 stadiums. Um, in bone marrow, we will get a lot more. However, in fat, we can take enough adipose tissue in a mini liposuction procedure that we are already at the therapeutic threshold of numbers that we need. So what does that really mean? It means that we do not have to culture. It can be a single setting. It can be an autologous procedure as a single setting. It makes it a far more cheaper exercise and a quicker exercise as well. If we look at regulations around the world, it's very clear whether it's the EU directive, the Australian TGA, the US FDA, the Korean, the Canadian, it's very simple. These procedures, as long as it's a medical, licensed medical practitioner doing this, these tissue and cells use as an autologous graft. As long as it's removed and given back to the patient in a single setting is exempt. As long as the cells are not highly manipulated, that's just a low manipulation, which usually means centrifugation and so forth. And the other thing about fat, well fat's been used for fat grafting, not just for cosmetic purposes, but if we go back to 1910, and these were some papers I was alerted to by Dr. Ellen Bogan in Beverly Hills who'd done a lot of fat grafting and had published in the area, who back in the late 50s was able to find these papers and translate them. They were, they were putting fat into tibial defects. They were putting them into joints. They realized even from back then that fat had some regenerative property, some repair property. And even fat grafts last longer. If you take any tissue and put it back into the body, it's gonna necroticize. Why did fat last so long? So we, we, we've come up with a method, a non-enzymic process of being able to take mesenchyme stem cells from lipoaspirate within a few minutes. We basically use a lecithin phosphatidylcholine based emulsifier to remove the lipids and then using gravity or centrifugation, we're able to take the stromal cells. However, as with the bone marrow, most mesenchyme stem cells are in a dormant state or an S0 state by putting them back into the body doesn't necessarily mean they're going to do something. So we then looked at can we activate these cells in some way? Can we prime them so when we give them back to the body very quickly, they'll be far more active and, get, and do their job far better? So we looked at various things. We looked at, there are many known stimulatory growth factors. Um, there's recombinant growth factors, synthetic, and they're quite expensive and exogenous. It no longer really becomes an autologous procedure. So we looked at platelet-rich plasma, and we all know platelets have a plethora of various growth factors, in particularly platelet-derived growth factor, that can activate or stimulate stem, stem cells, or in particular mesenchyme stem cells. And then we looked at the low-level monochromatic light, low-level laser, or low-level frequencies of light. We quite well know that if we put infrared light on a wound, there's a bit of an accelerating wound healing. If we shine it on our head, it'll help hair to grow. And the Russians, for many years, used to um, put uh, light into people's veins and used to see an amazing immunomodulatory effect, and it's still used in internal medicine in Russia. So this was of interest because it is a very low manipulation of the cells. So autologous platelet-rich plasma, or PRP as many people call it, Basically what we do in the procedure is take the platelets from 50 cc of blood, we clot the platelets, as you can see with a bit of calcium, and when the platelets clot, they release all their growth factors into the plasma here. So we remove the plasma and we use those to incubate with, um, so it keeps the procedure autologous. And there are many, many growth factor components of platelet-rich plasma or platelets that we well know. And platelet-rich plasma is quite widely used, as you well know, for a variety of different uh, accelerated healing abilities. So we know PRP contains many growth factors and has been successfully used clinically to improve hard and soft tissue healing. It's widely used both in the cosmetic as well 
as in the orthopaedic sports medicine field. And we also know that platelet-rich plasma can enhance the proliferation of human adipose-derived stem cells. So those growth factors there can help activate them. When we looked at lights, like I said before, we quite well know infrared, red lights, green lights, yellow lights, which are widely used in the cosmetic industry. Low level, not surgical cauterization lasers, have a lot of other effects than just um, a burning effect. So at a very low level, there's no burning effect. In fact, we know it's wound healing. Dentists use it quite widely for an anti-inflammatory. Blue lights are anti-infective, scarring, hair growth. So when we looked at that, we thought, well, maybe these will have some specific effect on stem cells if we shine the stem cells for a few minutes. And there was, there's some excellent articles out also published where they took mesenchyme stem cells, injected them into the infarcted rat heart where they caused a heart attack into the heart, into the heart of rats. And they put mesenchyme stem cells and they put mesenchyme stem cells after they had shined red light. And what they found is that if, if you looked at the endocardial um, infarct length after a period of time, that the mesenchyme stem cells would uh, help heal that area, but it was even shorter if they had been activated with two minutes of light. If we looked at uh, positive cells in the infarct area, once again, if it was shined with laser, um, there were far more cells in that area, as well as the density of blood vessels formed in the infarct area. So it's showing that at just two minutes of an infrared light was enough to um, activate these cells. And there's, because of time, I can't go into it too much longer. And there's plenty of other publications.